afternoon, everyone, and welcome to episode five of GSO Ocean Classroom Live, The Art of Ocean Acoustics, which is being funded again uh, today by the Devro Ocean Foundation. So thank you to Devro for their continued support. Hello to all of our audiences out there on Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, through Twitter, and of course, our podcast listeners. Remember, if you've missed previous episodes uh, or prefer to listen to these live events uh, while you're walking the dog, maybe, or while you're driving, you can now find Ocean Classroom Podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcast. Uh, so if you're already following, awesome. Um, and if you're listening now, thank you. Uh, so more information about these podcasts as well as the video archives for all of the previous Ocean Classroom Live episodes uh, and all the different associated resources can be found on the Ocean Classroom Live webpage. So definitely check it out. Uh, my name is Holly Morn. I'm a marine biologist and science communicator with the Inner Space Center at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. And I'm excited as always uh, to be again, uh, to again be your host today. Today. Um, the goal of the ocean classroom programs, it's, it remains the same. Um, so we're gonna be sharing a lot of really great ocean uh, knowledge and insight and art knowledge today as well uh, with our fantastic content experts. Uh, but we also really wanna keep things conversational. So your input from all that input from our audiences is super important to the success of today's program. Uh, so you can ask your questions at any time. You can put them there in the uh, comment box on Facebook or in the chat box on YouTube. Uh, and we'll try to get to as many of your questions today as possible. So we all always like to kick things off with a question for all of you. So where are you watching from today? Let us know what city and state. I hope it's better weather than we're having in Rhode Island here. It's kind of cloudy and uh, drizzly. So type that into the chat box there. Let us know where you're tuning in from today. Uh, while you're all typing in your answers, uh, just another quick reminder to be sure to follow your IGSO and the Inner Space Center on YouTube and Facebook uh, so you can stay up to date on all of these episodes and more. Uh, and if you're watching the replay, awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, and if you have a question, you know, when watching the replay, definitely type that in as well. And we'll try to answer that and get back to you as soon as we can. So let's check in, see where everybody's tuning in from today. Where are we tuning in from? Let's hope you guys typed in something there that we can bring up. If not, it looks like you're all tuning in from somewhere. <laughs> so Liz is tuning in from Wakefield. Hi, Liz. Thanks for typing that in. We appreciate it. Jane, always from Janestown. We always appreciate having you join us each noon. Thank you so much on these Thursday events. You can keep typing those in, folks. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, that'd be great. Hello from Annapolis. Hello from North Kingstown, Rhode Island. Pleasure to have you here with us today. Um, so today we're going to be talking about Ocean acoustics. Last week, we talked broadly about science and art and how they're both forms of exploration. Uh, both scientists and artists are investigating a phenomena or they're answering a question. Uh, and they're both very uh, diverse in their methods and results. So today we're gonna focus that conversation a little more and look specifically about the science of underwater sound or acoustics and then connections to art. Uh, we also wanna take a moment to actually acknowledge uh, Graduate School of Oceanography's 60th anniversary and that during GSO's first seminar series back in 1961, they discussed marine acoustics. And here we are 60 years later, still talking about this very important topic. Actually in 1956, the renowned French adventurer and scuba uh, inventor Jacques Cousteau, which we all hopefully know, uh, published a book and it was called The Silent World. And it was about the Earth's oceans. And it wasn't really the best title because the oceans are really, the ocean, the global ocean is far from silent. Uh, whether it be shipping activity, the hum associated with that, popping sounds from snapping shrimp, courtship calls of fishes or various sounds produced by marine mammals, the underwater environment is actually very acoustically active. Even in the deepest parts of the ocean, some 36,000 feet, nearly seven miles, scientists have recorded underwater sounds. Uh, they use something called a hydrophone, which is basically like an underwater microphone, it's a sound recording device, uh, and it picked up nearly constant sounds produced by sources including animals, typhoon ships, and they even detected an earthquake. So. Hopefully you all will understand that the ocean is not a quiet place and animals are using underwater sound, producing underwater sound because there's no light after 200 meters. And sound actually travels four to five times faster in the ocean than it does in air. So marine animals are using sound to communicate, find food, find mates, ward off predators, uh, also to navigate. And the same, humans also produce sound underwater, whether it be from activities on the surface, so shipping, uh, boats, small boats, and large ships as well. Uh, pile driving, that's an activity they use, think about dock building or putting out wind turbines, uh, putting large 
poles basically into the seabed. Uh, and then sonar, whether it's fisheries uh, for military purposes, et cetera. Uh, even natural phenomena, rain, wind, lightning, ice cracking, they all make sounds underwater. And both of our guests today have some really great insight and have explored this concept of underwater sound from a science and then an art perspective. And I'm really excited to speak with both of them today. So our first guest is Jennifer, uh, Dr. Jennifer Mixis Olds, who's actually a URI GSO alum. She's got her PhD here. Uh, and currently she's the director of the Center for Acoustics Research and Education at the University of New Hampshire, or UNH, which is actually where I got my undergrad degree. So I love that. Um, she's also a research professor in the School of Marine Science and Ocean Engineering at UNH and holds a research position at the UNH Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping. Her primary research interests are patterns uh, and trends of underwater sound in the ocean, animal behavior and communication, and then the environmental effects of anthropogenic or human generated activities. So Jen, why don't you sell, uh, say hello to our audiences, let them know a little bit more about yourself. And if you want to introduce the Atlantic Deep Water Ecosystem Observatory Network, or ADON, because that's a mouthful <laughs> otherwise, uh, please feel free. Okay, hi. Um, I'm Jen Mixes Old. I'm here at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, thank you for having me today. It's always great to connect with my alma mater. As um, Holly said, I did get my PhD from, from GSO URI. And so it's great to, to be here with you today. Uh, I'm here to talk about acoustics. And so I essentially use acoustic technology underwater in, in two different forms, passive acoustics, which essentially means listening to the ocean. And we record that with hydrophones, just like Holly said, and active acoustics. And so that's really when we produce a sound and record its, its echo return. You might know this as sonar. I don't use strong sonars. I use the type of sonars called echo sounders that you may be most familiar with on the bottom of a boat just to see how deep it is. So we can use those same types of echo sounders to understand um, about the fish and the zooplankton in the water column. And I use both types of these technology in a large project that we're involved with now off the southeast coast of the US from Virginia down to Florida called ADION. It's called the Atlantic Deepwater Ecosystem Observatory Network. And um, there's a map here, I think somewhere that they can put up and we have seven different sites. And what's really great about this project is that all of the data that we record and all of the products that we make are available to the public, other scientists, anybody interested in the data streams that are coming in. So not only do we use it for our project and our study, but people around the world are now downloading that data and using it for their studies. So I think I'll stop there and answer questions as they come in after all the introductions are done. Awesome. Thanks, Jen. Appreciate that. Um, also joining us today is a textile artist, so Lindsay Olson, uh, and her, uh, I almost said acoustic practice, her artistic practice, practice, goodness, really celebrates science, and I love that so much. She's made uh, some really unique connections uh, between her work and different science fields or groups, including particle accelerator facilities in Switzerland, um, the Chicago Botanical Gardens, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago, and then she also sailed uh, with Jen and her research crew on an ADON cruise, uh, and it was a three-day, uh, three-week cruise, excuse me, that actually took place on URI GSO's research vessel, the Endeavor. I have my Endeavor t-shirt on today to celebrate that. So, Lindsay, why don't you uh, say hello to our audience and tell them a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I'm a visual artist with a science-based practice, and what that means is that I partner with scientists, and I use my training as an artist to learn a particular corner of science. And there's three parts to my project. First, I the first thing is I have to learn the science. And in this case, it was ocean acoustics. Um, then I create art that incorporates the science that I've learned. And I use that artwork as a form of outreach. I want to inspire others to ask questions and be curious about science. I book exhibitions, I write articles, and I participate in events just like this. So thanks very much for inviting Jen and I to speak with you here today. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Lindsay. And thank you again to Chen. Uh, and I want to remind everybody out there that uh, this is a conversation. So um, all of you out there that are listening and tuning in today, please remember to ask your questions anytime during today's broadcast. Type them into that chat box or, chat box or the comment box. Um, and hopefully these quick introductions got the juices flowing. If you have any questions about maybe career paths or day in the life of an artist or an ocean scientist, or maybe what their favorite underwater sound is, right? Definitely ask at any time during today's broadcast. And actually, I'm going to flip it back and uh, 
play a sound for everybody, an underwater sound. And Lindsay and Jen, you can play along here as well. And we're going to see if everybody out there, what you think this sound might be. And remember, there's lots of different sounds underwater, whether it's animals, uh, human associated sound, natural sound. So uh, let's bring up this first sound and see what everybody thinks it might be. All right, awesome. So what do you think? Type that in there. Type in your responses into the chat box. And I was gonna take a little bit what you think that underwater sound might be. Lindsay, do you have any thoughts on what you think that sound might be? <laughs> oh my God. Well, um, you know what? I actually, I went through the Adion gallery and I didn't hear that one. So this is a new one for me. Has to be There's something low frequency. So maybe it's a big mammal, I don't know. There you go. I love that you you said this is something new to you. And and Jen, you can kind of speak to this, I think, is that there's lots of sounds we hear, right, that are new to us that we don't know what they are. Yeah, I have to say, too, um, I'm always learning. That's one great thing about my job is I get to learn all the time. So I remember I was going through recordings from some of our Arctic work and I heard a sound. It sounded like an alien, an underwater alien. And I don't know if you want to play it now, but so people can hear about it and then I'll tell you what it is or people can even guess what it is if you want to do guess that game. But this one stumped me and I actually had to reach out to colleagues and say, hey, what is this? And finally, someone said, oh, I know what that is. And Are you sure that wasn't aliens is trying to communicate with you, it, you know, underwater? It, it's <laughs> It's very loud, um, and I'll actually tell you what it is. It's actually um, sea ice. It's sheets of sea ice as it's forming, grading into, grading into each other and, and overlapping, and it makes these tonal, loud alien sounds, but it's the, the life of ice. There it is. And then to, to go back to that low frequency sound, Lindsay, you are actually exactly right. It is a big mammal. That is a blue whale. Uh, oh. That is what some of their vocalizations sound like underwater. Um, and yeah, when you said big, big marine mammal, that's about as big as you get. So you were right, even if we didn't have the exact species. Well, perfect. Yeah, no, there you go. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit more, um, Jen, about the, the Adion site. Um, and the goal of this is to kind of, from what I understand, is to collect some baseline data, data and better understand the underwater acoustics of this region. So how do you go about collecting that? I know you talked about the passive acoustics and active acoustics that you use, but could you speak a little bit more to some of the tools that you're using uh, out at sea? Sure. So what we're using on the Adion project is an ocean bottom lander. So it's an ocean bottom platform that we're able to mount lots of different instruments to. Um, I think that you can, there's one right there on the, on the back of the Alusha. And so uh, I'll just go through a little bit. So this is the lander. It drops off. We deploy it off the side of the boat and it floats down to the bottom and sits there until we come back and get it. Uh, underneath each of those little yellow hats is a hydrophone. So we have four hydrophones there. We have an echo sounder on some of our landers with four frequencies. So we can look at zooplankton and fish. Um, we have a, uh, CTD, which is temperature, conductivity, um, dissolved oxygen sensors. And then we have all of the different things that we need to, to get it back in case it comes up prematurely or in case it um, gets trawled by a fishing vessel, which has happened in the past many times. It's got a satellite beacon on it so we can know where it is on the, the surface of the earth anytime it comes to the surface. So we use all of those, we can, and we can mount all different types of things on there. Uh, for some of these landers, we have fish detectors. So any, any fish or sharks that are tagged in the ocean, we can get a detection every time they go by. We've actually had more sharks, I think, than fish lately. So that's kind of cool. Awesome, that's, that's fantastic. And then what types of sounds have you recorded? Uh, have you got, have you, I'm assuming, I think you've collected some of the data from the landers thus far. Um, what mm -hmm. type of sounds have you recorded off the, the East Coast or the Atlantic Coast here? Oh boy, um, off the East Coast, we get lots of different types of marine mammals from big whales to dolphins. We've gotten fish. We get a lot of human sounds. So we get ships. We've actually detected seismic air gun signals all the way from across the Atlantic because low frequency sound travels so well underwater. Um, what else have we gotten? We have had actually a few direct hurricanes go right over the landers. 
<laughs> so we've been able to get the soundscape and how it changes and what it sounds like as the eye of a hurricane passes right over that that particular spot of the ocean. And we Ooh, have that's, students work. Yeah, yeah, super fascinating. Yeah, I have a student working on that right now. I can't wait to see the end of her research. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I would. It's very interesting because, you know, I talk all the time with students in there, you know, where does an animal go during a hurricane? You know, where do you want them to really go? This is their home. They can only move so far. And But it is interesting to see how um, the sound changes uh, when before and after a hurricane, for sure, in an area. Um, Lindsay, so a little bit about your craft. So now we know some of the tools that um, Jen has deployed for Adion off the coast there to uh, understand the acoustics of the region. Uh, could you talk a little bit more as a textile artist um, and you were out on the cruise, you know, what was inspiring you about that work uh, to create your art? And then how do you go about creating these various pieces? I love when you talk about um, the different pieces that you've made. Um, well, as a textile artist, it's a great medium because it really helps me shrink the distance between the science and the art and the people who are looking at it. And to use it as an outreach tool, it's a really good connection because everybody uses textiles in their everyday lives. You know, we dress and we furnish our homes and all sorts of things. So textiles is a very approachable art medium. Um, <laughs> this is a picture of me stitching on the way home. Mind you, we were all working. Uh, very, very hard during the entire cruise. And if you look in that picture, you can see that there's a very large um, wave situation happening. There's terrible weather out in the back on our way home. Um, but I chose a special kind of silk for the background of these pieces called Dupiani silk, which has a very pronounced grain line. And what I did was I shifted the grain line in the squares as I sewed the background together to make the surface shimmer like the um, surface of the ocean. Um, and then uh, this is a sketch. This is what my sketchbook looks like. I do keep a paper, traditional paper sketchbook, but I really want to work out in advance before I cut out something huge like these 36 inch by 48 inch pieces. I need to, to test out the materials and test out the stitches to just get the exact right materials to express the science that I'm looking at. And one of the things that really impressed me the most was when I was looking at the echograms of um, the night crew, there is this huge migration um, of zooplankton that happens every um, dusk and every dawn. So it, as soon as the sun went down, you can see on the echogram uh, a very large swoop. This isn't the echogram. I think this might be one of the hydrophone ones, but the one that has the kind of S-shaped swoop. Yeah, so at the very top of this piece, this is kind of a representation of what the echogram looked like at dawn and dusk when the um, animals scoot to the surface, they feed all night in the dark. And as soon as dawn approaches, they come back down. This is a great survival strategy because all of the denizens of uh, the plankton are basically food for everything in the ocean. And in the open ocean, there really isn't any place to hide. So they kind of protect themselves by feeding at night. So that was one very inspiring thing that I learned about on the trip. And I love, just from my background working um, on an acoustics project, I can completely get the feel of that echogram from looking at um, your that that textile piece that you created. And I really love that. Um, it looks like we have a, you're welcome. It looks like we have a question, which is fantastic. So Marilyn would like to know, um, how do you identify what you're hearing? Fantastic question. Because sometimes there are sounds that are out there that we don't even hear, right, Jen? So how do we go about figuring out what it is that we're hearing or that you're hearing that scientists are hearing when they're recording underwater? There we go, had to unmute myself there. <laughs> um, so we, there's two parts to that question, um, or I should say two answers. And the first is I use my eyes and I use my ears. So we can, we can obviously listen and we have um, a so software, acoustic processing technology that allows you to actually convert what you're hearing to a spectrogram. And I think I have one of those that we can put up. Yep, and there's time on the bottom axis on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis. So um, the frequency is just the pitch. The higher the frequency, the higher the, um, the, the tintier or um, it sounds. And here I've just put up three a spectrogram of about five seconds with a, you could have like seen a walrus and a bearded seal and a ribbon seal. And as that sound clip plays, you can actually hear and see the sound at the same time. So it would be great if you could put that spectrogram back up and play the audio that goes with it. 
and by, I'll, I'll pause here for a second, see if that can come back up. So that was just five seconds in the, in the Arctic with three different types of pinnipeds, a, a walrus, a bearded seal, and a ribbon seal. And we get really good at knowing what sounds the animals make. So that helps identify them. But the thing that's really crucial is that to that is, is knowing what sounds they make. And that's essentially an underwater dictionary that you build upon throughout time. So we rely on scientists doing very detailed work to identify an animal and its sound from, you know, 50, 60 years ago, people have been doing this. And so the work that I'm doing today is really, I build on what other researchers have done to identify those sounds. Great, thanks. And if anyone else has questions, definitely keep typing them in, <clears throat> excuse me, to the comment in the chat boxes and YouTube and Facebook, and we'll get to uh, mm -hmm. those as many as we can today. Uh, really quickly, Gemma, we were talking about um, hurricanes and how the soundscape changes uh, as a storm passes through. I'm curious, as, so with COVID, with the pandemic, obviously a lot of activity changed in the past year. Has that impacted underwater environments at all, or is this something that scientists are looking at? Yep, there's a lot of work going on in that right now. There's been some published work in very coastal areas and ports that the sound levels have dropped. Uh, the Vancouver port, there was a publication on that one. It just, just dropped for a few months at the very beginning of COVID um, and picked right back up as all the ships started to, to come back last summer. Uh, we have data from the Adion project that we're looking at now, and we're seeing COVID signals, a decrease in, in some of our sites closest to shipping lanes, but in other areas far from shore on the outer continental shelf, we haven't picked up a COVID signal at all. So that's preliminary work that we're still working with statisticians on to making sure we're interpreting those signals correctly. People are doing that all over the world right now. Great, yeah, and it's one of those things too where I feel like individuals had instruments that were out at sea that they couldn't go retrieve, so stayed out during that period of time, yep. and now they're kind of pulling them back in, so it'll be really interesting, again, like you're saying, to see what they find out as the data is uh, examined. So we have a question from Ryan. Uh, Ryan would like to know, what is the difference between a spectrogram and an echogram? Ah, that, that's a good question. Both of them produce sound images and they allow you to see what your ears are hearing in some way. So a spectrogram is related to the passive acoustics and it allows you to see um, the different frequencies and how they change over time. So this is a spectrogram, I would say, associate spectrograms with passive acoustics. And the echogram is again, time is on the X axis, but this time instead of frequency, it's depth on the Y axis. So here, you're, this is an echogram um, with the transducer or the echo sounder on the bottom of the ocean on our lander and it is sending out a ping or a signal up towards the surface at the top and then the backscatter um, comes back. That signal bounces off the surface, bounces off fish, bounces off zooplankton and comes back to the lander. And that echogram is the, the echo time series of what we're getting back at the lander. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you for explaining that so beautifully. That was really well put. Um, we have another question from our audience. So let's bring that one up. So Kim, hi, Kim. Thank you for your question. would like to know, how are scientists and artists both currently using the study of ocean acoustics to promote biological and ecological oceanic conservation and preservation? What an awesome, awesome question. So Lindsay, I'm gonna field this to you first because I know you've done a lot of work with your art on various topics and engaging audiences and talking about the environment, um, et cetera. So why don't uh, you go ahead and field this first for us? I, I think the biggest thing that I'm hoping to accomplish when I do outreach anywhere I go is to make people aware of what's happening below the ocean because we're land dwelling terrestrial creatures. Most of us don't really even think about the ocean unless we, we eat fish for dinner or something. There is so much that's so important about the ocean that I want people to understand, for instance, that half the planet's oxygen comes from phytoplankton, the other half comes from terrestrial plants. And there's many, many ocean processes we don't understand fully. And uh, I think that is an important outreach objective. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. And then, Jen, from the, the science side of the house, you know, how is uh, ocean acoustics work being used to kind of promote conservation, management, preservation, et cetera? 
Um, I have to say, I loved working with Lindsay throughout this project because sound, even, even in our own lives, in, in air and, and on land, people underestimate or it doesn't get enough doesn't get enough stage time as it should because sound tells us so much and usually we only recognize sound when there's a problem bad restaurant acoustics or your hearing but underwater it's so different sound is used by almost all living things underwater to sense their environment and by humans to to sense the environment underwater just like Lindsay said it's it's our it's our um, magical telescope into what's happening underwater and I think that working with Lindsay and seeing the beautiful textiles she made um, reminds people that of the crucial nature of sound to marine life and to humans underwater. It's how we sense best underwater. And so, you know, uh, in the media, there's a lot of um, press time related to the negative effects of human sound on animals and people tend to forget how useful sound is to the animals themselves. And so the, and expressing the use and utility and value and significance of sound underwater, she did that through her art. And it is just a different message than you get in the typical media. And that's, I've loved that. Yep, I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. So the questions are coming in, which is great. Keep them coming. So I think we have another question about uh, whale songs. Yep, there we go. Perfect. Priscilla asked, thank you, Priscilla. I've heard songs created by whales. Uh, do other sea creatures do anything like that? So Jen, do other animals, I mean, what other sounds, what other animals make sounds underwater? I know there are lots of them. Do you have any, what's your favorite example? Um. My favorite sounds come from Antarctica, the, the ice seals, the Ross, and the Waddell seals. Um, and in answer to the song question, lots of different whales make songs, um, but some of, there are seal songs too, pinnipeds make songs. When we played that sound clip, um, the bearded seals make these beautiful trill-like songs. Um, you could actually say that maybe fish make songs just like the whales because fish advertise their, those are their mating displays for fish, just like whale songs are mating displays for the whales. So there are lots of animals um, in the ocean that use sound as part of their mating system um, that could be construed loosely as song. I actually, I don't know if we could uh, to bring this up, Jess, I don't know if we have it, um, the Lana Croker sound file that you had, mm. If you could play that, I know we had it as a, a what is that sound, but if you want to, if you could play it, um, that'll give you a great example of what some of these fish sounds sound like that are for mating. I love that um, because you can actually hear the frequency shift that occurs too. Um, and this is a croaker and these species of fish, uh, they, they have their swim bladder, which is basically like a balloon in their bellies that they use to regulate their buoyancy. So how they're floating in the water column. Um, and they actually have muscles against that bladder that will drum or will um, oscillate or they'll contract and, um, and uh, relax. And they, and just like a regular drum, if you're hitting it with sticks, it makes that bladder resonate or vibrate and produces those sounds, um, which I, those are actually Atlantic croaker or fish that you find right here off the Northeast coast. Um, you may be eating one for dinner. So, <laughs> um, and it looks like we have another question, uh, maybe about, this one looks like it might be about earthquakes. Yep. Okay. Hi, Anne. Thank you for your question. Do you hear an increase or decrease in sounds, whether it's animal, ocean floor surfaces, in the area of an underwater earthquake, so before or after a rupture? So I think that might be stemming from talking about hurricanes and talking about how ch sound changes underwater. Um, and if, you know, it, does that cause any changes, Jen, that in the soundscapes you guys record? Well, I can say definitely that the sound of the earthquake itself is very loud and it's very rumbly and it's not just one instance. It actually happens over days and hours because those plates move. Um, I don't know of any research specifically that looked at how the animals react to that because the trick is you never know where these earthquakes are going to happen and you would have had to have the recording or observation equipment out at that area at that time. So um, the only thing I can think of, there's a data set from the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. Um, they have an international monitoring system of hydrophones that record 
um, earthquakes all of the time. So that's a data set that I could see people using to answer those types of questions. I just don't know of any research specifically re related to the answer of that question right now. And if not, there's a new area to explore, right? <laughs> There's always new areas. <laughs> always, always, always a question to answer. Lindsay, I think you actually mentioned that you might have a seismic event that was captured in one of your textile pieces. Yes, um, there's a seismic I uh, did embroider and bead on the passive acoustics piece. It's the it's the data that's um, just outside the dark blue ring in the center, that one that has beads that are light and then the dark portion. That is a seismic event that was captured on one of the um, uh, hydrophones. That's what the data actually looks like. Awesome, and Michelle, thank you for saying how gorgeous her work is. I agree that Lindsay's work is pretty fantastic. Um, so we have actually come up to our half hour, 30 minute mark. It always goes so quickly, especially when the topics are so interesting. But thank you, Lindsay and Jen, and thank you to all of our audiences uh, for joining today um, and all the great questions that were coming through. Um, hopefully everybody kind of now has an appreciation of how, how noisy the underwater environment can be uh, and the diversity of sounds uh, that we can record there. Um, and I think, I, I want to give a nod to Lindsay because I think it's your work is a really fantastic example of um, the needing the not needing to be a science right a scientist to necessarily enjoy science communicate about science. Um, you had a quote where you know seeing things or art is such a different way than just a spoken word to communicate about something right. And I think that this is a really great example of that, and we really appreciate it. Um, and it, it on those really helps that Jen's project was so inspiring. Gotta love it, I love it. Um, and this actually ties really, uh, ties nicely back to um, the Ocean View Art Exhibition. So this is like a Ocean Classroom Live event. We always like to have a little bit of homework at the end. Um, so you wanna make sure folks to mark your calendar for that. It's actually taking place now through April 29th at the University of Rhode Island's Providence Campus Gallery over on Washington Street. Um, the art is being uh, displayed in the lobbies on the first and second floor. Um, and it's actually uh, 20 plus uh, professional artists have supplied pieces. And then there's over 200 of Rhode Island's K through 12 students that submitted uh, to the art competition that is uh, associated with this as well. So go check out all the wonderful arts that uh, art that's on display there. Um, there's a gallery night scheduled for April 15th, uh, but there are other set times uh, to view the gallery or visit, and you can actually uh, go online to the Ocean Art View uh, website and or the GSO webpage, and that will give you more details. And then there's also an online gallery, um, so you can view all of the different pieces there online as well if you'd like to. Uh, the other thing to note, I kind of said this at the beginning, is that GSO is celebrating its six 60th anniversary this year. Um, and it was really great to think about that first seminar that happened back in 1961 that was on acoustics and, and then learning about what we're doing now and how this is such a, a relevant topic to keep exploring. Um, definitely check out the GSO website for more about the 60th anniversary activities and the history of GSO. There's a really great timeline uh, that shows all the different parts of GSO's history, which is a nifty tool there. And then there's an audio gallery associated with the Adion website uh, to hear some of those sounds that uh, Jen was talking about. And then also there's a discovery of sound in the sea or Dosit's website. There's an audio gallery there as well as a whole comprehensive suite of acoustics topics, uh, content on different underwater sound topics. So check that out if you get a chance to as well. Uh, Jen, Lindsay, before we go, any final thoughts from you all about uh, ocean science art or anything you'd like to say to our audiences before we sign off? <laughs> oh, Lindsay's Lindsay's muted there. Sorry. I just hope it inspires more people to think about science and, and to take a chance to just read, you know, pick up a book, pick up a popular science book and start investigating what you want to be curious about. I guess my final parting words are listen to the world around you. You can really learn a lot. And for all those researchers out there, if you get a chance to work with an artist, take it. It it allows you to see your own field and what you do every day in a completely different light. And I appreciated very much that experience. That just gave me goosebumps. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our audiences today, again, for your great questions. And thank you to the Devereaux Ocean Foundation for their continued support. Uh, check out all those different websites that have been listed. Um, and for all the information about the other projects that were discussed today, mark your calendars for the next Ocean Classroom Live event. So that's going to be on Tuesday, April 27th. Um, it's going to be a live event from the Ocean View Art Exhibition. So not our traditional classroom event, um, as it'll be focused on the art exhibition. And I 
believe, announcing the, the contest winners. So uh, definitely mark your calendar for that. And then continue to follow along social media, URI, GSO, Interspace Center, et cetera. Uh, please subscribe uh, and share. Um, and then stay tuned uh, for future GSO classroom events. There's a feedback form. So if there are topics that you would like us to explore and discuss further, uh, definitely let us know and, and provide us some comments if you can. Otherwise, thank you again, Lindsay and Jen. This has been fantastic. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us today and to everybody else out there. Please be well, be safe, and we'll catch you again soon. Bye.